Hello, this is David Scher. I'm back for another uh, round in Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. Uh, last week we covered a lot of information about photons interacting in matter, and today we're going to move on to the charged particle. This is uh, rather dry information. It's pretty theoretical and esoteric uh, for some of you. It is uh, material you've covered before in Physics 571. For some of you, it's brand new and probably coming very quickly. It's just a review of what we've done before. You'll take Physics 571 and you'll uh, see a lot more details about this material. But right now I'm trying to lay a groundwork so we can get into radiation safety. And uh, so we need to have some of the, the background information for that. Uh, now we're gonna talk about charged particles and how they interact with matter. And that will have uh, important um, implications for us in radiation safety. So first of all, uh, let's talk a little bit, review a little bit of basic information about charged particles, about the forces between charged particles. Uh, it's called the Coulomb force. Um, the things to recognize was the, the mathematical equation for it is at the bottom of this uh, figure, the force between the two charges. Uh, well, for like charges, both positive or both negative, they repel each other. If they're opposite charges, they attract, and, and so the force pulling them together. The force increases with the size of the charge, it's Q, the value of Q1 or Q2, and the force decreases with the distance. In fact, it says the distance squared. Now, for the atomic processes we're talking about. The, there's a basic unit of charge for the electron or the proton. This is uh, the value of it on this slide in uh, um, SI units. Um, we're just gonna call it E. It's a fixed amount. It's the same. Uh, electrons don't have all different values of charge. They have one set value of charge. Uh, same thing for protons. Um, so, uh, we're just going to refer to this as E, but this is the numerical value of it. Okay, this is just a little bit of setting the context for where we are. We talked before about uh, neutrons and protons building up nu the nucleus. There is a, a chart of all the different nuclei that have been observed. And, uh, the black line down the middle is the line of stability, and the uh, Proton number, this is the neutron number, the, nucle nu the nuclei, the species that are off of the line of stability are unstable and want to get back to the line of stability. They do that by certain interactions, certain decay methods, either beta decay, alpha decay, uh, and the day, beta plus the decay as well. Uh, so these are all charged particles. So it's an electron or a positron or a helium nucleus alpha particle. So those are the particles we're going to get. When these these particles, these nuclei undergo decay, the particles have energy and they're going to interact with some other matter after they've left their um, parent nucleus. Alpha particles are, as, as I said, the, uh, identical with the helium nucleus. They have two protons, two neutrons. They have a positive charge. The magnitude is two times the electric charge. They're relatively heavy particles. There are four atomic mass units, or 3.73 MeV. And uh, when they, uh, uh, the nucleus undergoes a decay and emits an alpha particle, the alpha particles from a given reaction all have the same energy value. So they're not released with a continuous spectrum of energy. They're uh, released with a fixed energy like the photons were in those other um, decays we talked about. Next set of, of decay possibilities are uh, beta decay. There are negative and positive beta decays. So um, uh, one version of this, a neutron becomes a proton and uh, gives off a, uh, an electron and an antineutrino. Uh, the electron that's released, the beta particle, is identical with an atomic electron. It has a negative charge and a value of E, just the electron charge. 
Another version of this is beta um, positron decay or beta plus decay. In this case, a proton becomes a neutron. It, it's this process in reverse. If we reverse all these arrows, it would give us the, the process. A, a, a proton becomes a neutron. It emits a positron uh, and a, a neutrino. It has a positive charge, same magnitude as the electron, but just the opposite sign. Uh, the mass of both these particles is the same. It's uh, very small compared to a proton or a neutron. Uh, and in um, energy terms, it's about a half of an MeV, 0.511 MeV. Now we, the uh, nuclear transition has a fixed value of Q. The electron or positron that's emitted can have a spectrum of values all the way up to the value of Q. You saw those graphs before. Um, and we ran into this in a homework problem uh, about the average energy. Um, so we're familiar, but I just want to remind you. Okay, another source of charged particles are J electrons. Um, you were asked to describe this in the homework last week, and everybody did a really good job. They're emitted uh, when, uh, as an alternate means of, of giving off energy when there's an atomic transition in the outer shells of the electron. Uh, they have a fixed energy difference, a fixed energy value, not a continuous uh, uh, set of energies like the beta decay does, and the, the source of that energy where you derive, find the OJ electron energy is right here. Um, there are great detail, but they're, they're out there and they're, they have some application. Protons, which are the same as the hydrogen nucleus, they're not a common form of decay, but they come about from some uh, other reactions, from nuclear fission, from man-made sources like uh, nuclear reactors and cosmic rays. Uh, the same is true for heavier nuclei. They emerge from the sun. The sun is, and other stars are basically um, uh, fusion factories that uh, produce heavy uh, 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 uh Some of them are emitted during solar flares or from galactic sources. Uh, and they can, uh, when people travel in space, these are going to be important contributions to the radiation dose. And we're going to try to talk about this a little bit this semester. So they will be charged particles, um, these ions that are um, lying around in space. We don't deal with them much on Earth because the Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field. The magnetic field causes these charged particles that are coming toward the Earth to bend and turn away. Uh, a, charge, a moving charge in a magnetic field experiences a force that's perpendicular to its motion, and so that deflects the, the charged particles. That's why we don't um, have to deal with them in our background, uh, in our background radiation very much. Okay, so these high energy particles are incident, can be incident on matter, some medium. Uh, and medium is composed itself of electrons and nuclei that are also charged particles, and that's why the electric force is at work. The incoming charged particle meets up with the charged particles in the material. Um, and so, uh, there's an electric force between these two groups of, of particles. And uh, so there's a whole bunch of electrons in the medium. The incident charged particle interacts with a whole bunch of them as it passes through. The photon interacted one time and had a Compton event or a photoelectric absorption or a pair production reaction. Uh, uh, charged particles interact with many, many electrons as they pass through the material. Uh, um, so here's an example. Uh, let's talk a little bit about electrons that are entering a material. When high energy electrons enter a material, they scatter with other electrons. Um, so uh, when two particles undergo an elastic scattering, a scattering that uh, serves all the kinetic energy, the maximum energy that can be transformed or, or transferred from one to the other is given by this formula. Uh, Staben goes through several steps to arrive at this, so if you're interested, let's look at it. 
um, related to the masses of the particles involved. So we can think about this as in terms of two billiard balls on a table can share their energy equally. You can roll a billiard ball, hit a, another a resting billiard ball on the nose, and the initial ball can come to rest and the other ball can fly out. You can transfer all the energy from one particle to the other if they have the same mass. However, if you have a billiard ball and you throw it against a bowling ball, it cannot transfer all its energy to the bowling ball uh, and come to rest. Uh, it can only transfer a fraction based on the masses. Um, so uh, for electrons interacting with other electrons in the medium, uh, they can transfer all of their energy. The average amount of energy they transfer is half of their energy for any given interaction. So an electron can interact and cause the electrons in the medium to carry a large amount of energy. They can interact with other electrons uh, and share their energy with, with and the secondary uh, electrons share their energy with more electrons. They share their energy with more electrons. You have sort of a um, cascade effect. And so energy can be transferred. And also the scattering is through a wide angle. It's not just like a, a barreling on through without much deflection. They, they can uh, scatter through wide angles. And so you have sort of a, a cloud of energy spread when you have electrons uh, entering, uh, high energy electrons entering the medium. Um, another way electrons can lose energy is through radiative energy loss. This is Bremsstrahlen. We talked about it before, I believe. The electrons can be uh, attracted. If they pass close by the nucleus, they can be slowed down by the nucleus and then they have to give up some energy. Because the nucleus is very heavy, they can't transfer the kinetic energy to the nucleus. So they give off their energy as uh, photons. Uh, and we talked about that as a source of photons. But this is also a way that electrons lose energy, and it has to be taken into account. This is um, uh, not important for heavy particles, ions like alpha particles, uh, because they don't undergo the same kind of, of uh, reflections. Uh, they're just much heavier than the electrons are. Okay, um, so when we talk about uh, electrons losing their, their energy in material. The concept, the, the, the quantity that we're talking about is called the stopping power. The linear stopping power is the rate of, as I said, they, they continuously give up their energy. It's not a one and done situation like photons. They give up their energy continuously along their path. And, and the amount that they give up is called the linear stopping power. The, the different, uh, um, Ionization and, excita and exciting ex excitation reactions with atoms are ways they transfer energy. Uh, and uh, Bremsstrahlen, they give up energy uh, through uh, other photons, or two photons through Bremsstrahlen. And the quantity, that, so this is the amount of energy, dE is the energy loss, dx is the distance traveled. So for every small length of distance, a small amount of energy is given up. The stopping power is the negative of that because they're decreasing energy. So stopping power wanted to be a positive number. And that's um, uh, in units of MeV per centimeter. The total stopping power is a combination of the collisional stopping power and the radiative stopping power. Okay. Um, we've also got a concept of mass stopping power. Remember before with photons, we had the linear attenuation coefficient the linear absorption coefficient, and then the mass attenuation coefficient, the mass uh, absorption coefficient. We have the same sort of trick with stopping power of charged particles or of electrons. Um, and the units here, if we divide by the density, MeV per centimeter, this is cubic centimeter per gram. Divide them all out, and you get MeV square centimeter per gram. Uh, Reason for using mass stopping power it removes some of the variability that's solely due to the density of the medium. For example, if you have oxygen in air as a gas, uh, and you have oxygen in uh, as a component in a solid, the mass stopping power is the same, even though the densities of the two matters, two two forms are very different. Um, it's the same trick we use with the uh, photons. 
So what you're going to see in the next slide is it turns out that S over rho is pretty constant over a broad range of energies from uh, and it's about 2 MeV square centimeter per gram over a broad range of energies and for different materials. Um, not the next slide, but it's coming up. Here's the formula for, by which mass stopping power is calculated for electrons. Uh, it's a complicated formula. Uh, some important parameters. This beta is, is actually V over C. It's a velocity as a fraction of the speed of light. Um, so the, uh, the um, uh, is important. That's related to the, the uh, well, anyway, the, 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 the density of electrons is involved, the uh, cross-section of the electron, and um, that's going to be important later on. And then there are factors related to the uh, uh, particles that are passing through. They're given here. Um, uh, it's just a formula that people use. I don't think that health physicists use it very often. I'd rather we look, uh, look up the values. There's a graph of the electron mass stopping power. So the collisional mass stopping power you saw is this red dash line here. Uh, the radiative stopping power is this green dash line down here, and they add up to the total, which is the black line. Now you can see that at low energies, the radiative stopping power, the bremsstrahlung, is a very tiny fraction of the collisional mass for most light materials. And silver is not so light. I chose a, a material that's relatively high in the atomic number spectrum to show it's very similar. But look, this is uh, 10 to the, that's maybe 20, 2 times 10. And this is, you know, um, 0.04. It's very small uh, compared to that. It's a, it's a three orders of magnitude or so smaller. So um, at low energies, Bram Strong is on. But you can see, as I said, there's a constant value in both, in, in many cases, it's 2 MeV a gram per square centimeter for lots of materials from, I don't know, an MeV on. So that's an important uh, observation. Pretty much give up the energy, same amount of energy per unit length until they start slowing down. And then they enter a one over phase where they um, uh, give up more energy as it gets slower. Electron range is uh, uh, that is electrons are losing energy along their path and eventually they give up all their energy and stop. We could calculate using this DEDX formula what the range is, right? Because uh, it, uh, move dx to the other side, get the uh, calculate the, the distance that it's passing, traveling. Uh, um, do that for the we'll show you that for the uh, heavier ions, but um, it, it's not very practical in uh, the terms of the electron because DEDX is the energy being lost along the electron's path. The electron is taking a very tortuous path going all different kinds of directions. So the DEDX is along these bendy paths, these curvy paths, not the linear distance into the material. So it wouldn't be a very useful uh, exercise anyway to calculate DE at DX that way. So if we're interested in straight line distance, they will travel in a material. The range is given by this formula right here. Uh, it's been uh, demonstrated uh, in most material, in many uh, light materials. And uh, so this is the formula you see. You can see it's in um, uh, your book by Staben as well. Here's a graph of it for different electron energies, what the range is in square centimeter per gram. This is milligrams, so it's three orders of magnitude. This, where is it? Um, this was 0.412. This formula is 412. That's milligrams, factor of a thousand difference. That's why. Okay. Um,
Now let's talk about heavier ions, uh, protons, helium ions, which are alpha particles, etc. Now we have the same formula about the uh, billiard balls and, and how much energy can be transferred uh, for very heavy material uh, items uh, like um, alpha particles colliding into very light objects like electrons. Not much of the energy can be transferred in a single interaction. However, so, however, alpha particles, uh, well, and because they're not transferring a, a ton of energy in each interaction, they're um, strongly deflected. They, this is a, a, a picture of alpha particle tracks going through um, uh, moist air, and they move along in a very uh, straight path. Uh, they're not bouncing around the way the electrons were. Uh, but they have uh, two positive charges, so they interact with um, very densely with the electrons there because they're much, there's a much stronger um, electrical force between all the electrons and the alpha particles. So they're densely ionizing. They lumber through slowly and, and deposit a lot of energy and don't deflect very much. The formula for uh, DEDX, energy loss per unit length, uh, from your book, from the, the Staven book that you can get. Um, it's very similar to the other formula. Um, you don't have those factors, those F factors related to whether it's an electron or positron in this case. But once again, it's 1 over V squared. And it, uh, so the fact that it's two electric charges means it's four times more uh, energy being deposited per unit length. Uh, another thing that's, inter that's important to know, or should be noted, you might heard about. So um, this graph has a minimum, and at high values of energy, when V is uh, rise again because of this logarithm. So when we get to the plot, I'll, sh I'll mention uh, from ionizing particles and the logarithmic uh, rise. I here is the ionization. Of whatever the material is, how many, how much energy it takes to ionize the material. So uh, again, because this, uh, one of the things that should be observed in charged particles is that they transfer their energy th uh, to material as they pass along. As they get to lower speeds, the amount of energy being transferred is greater. They end up giving more and more um, energy in their path. In addition, alpha particles that are at, traveling at slow speed interact with uh, the nucleus and transfer energy to the nucleus as well. Uh, nuclear reactions, uh, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, and um, so that gives rise to a lot of energy being deposited at the end of their path when they're very lo low kinetic energy. They have fixed distances they travel, it's called the range, and then they stop. Okay, this is um, interactions of a, a charged particle. I think this is an alpha particle interacting uh, through the material. It interacts with the electrons. That's the red dashed line. The most of the higher energies, it interacts almost entirely with the electrons, at very low energies. The nuclear interaction is right here. There is an electric force and an electric interaction, or an interaction with the nucleus, uh, and it's actually greater than the electron interactions at very slow speeds. So that contributes to the bag, bag peak. Particles, the next one I think is for, uh, this shows the range of alpha particles. So I showed you the, the um, Bragg peak. I think this is for protons. For the for electrons, the range is the energy the loss. Yeah. So this is uh, the um, I can derive this. I think it's done in the. In the uh, so uh, the EDX is the distance you travel. Uh, the energy loss per distance traveled, and that's equal to the stopping power. If we 
put dx on one side of the equation and everything else on the other side of the equation, get dx is equal to dE over the stopping power. Integrate dx, that's gives you how far it travels, it gives you it is equal to the integral of dE over the stopping power. So this way of calculating the range called the continuous slowing down approximation, it's calculating the range based on dE dx or based on the stopping power as a function of energy. Add up all those stopping powers from zero energy up to the incident energy and that gives you the range. This is a graph showing the, the stopping power at different depths as it slows down, as the stopping power increases until it reaches some, some point where it has no more energy and uh, ends up being a range. Um, ranges for alpha particles and for protons, so helium nuclei and, and hydrogen nuclei are available in uh, a database from this website. Um, uh, there's also on that database a, there is also on that site a database for electrons. Uh, so E star, E star, P for proton, A for alpha, E for electron. So this is the, the what the web page looks like. You scroll down, you click a link, and you uh, can ask for what your what your which um, type of material you're, uh, which type of radiation you're looking at, what type of material you're, you're traveling through. So what I plotted or got from there are the range values for protons and for alpha particles in water. And you can see that the CSDA approximation, which is the, the solid line, is very close to a different kind of way of estimating it called the projected range over a very long uh, variety of incident energies. This is the incident alpha uh, this is proton. The incident proton energy, and this is what the range would be. This is the incident alpha energy, and what the range should be. The the um, the approximation is not as good at very low energies, for, with, with an initial uh, energy of that's not very high. Um, so there's also uh, an empirical formula that's approximate value for the range of an alpha particle in air, and this is uh, also in the Staven book, They're, the values are shown here. Uh, and for other media, it uh, varies, the range varies as the um, uh, atomic mass of the material. Okay. Now, another concept we should consider is DEDX, is the pot deposited along the path of the particle. Uh, and that's what this is. It's, it's the KEV per micron. Uh, and this is what the EDX looks like for protons and for electrons. Um, so um, this is the linear energy transfer for electrons is not as great as it is for protons because they're not penetrating, they're curling back on themselves. Um, so this LET is based on the depth in the medium. It's not based on following the particle path length. And um, uh, this, this is uh, an important quantity that's used for radiation biology, and we'll talk about it, I think, next time when we uh, discuss this. Um, so that's what I have for today. I thank you for your attention. Um, wish you well. Uh, I have given you another assignment as you I worked out the uh, homework problem for you on a video as well. So um, I look forward to hearing from you with those. If you have uh, questions or need clarification or need guidance, uh, you know how to get in touch with me, email, discussion board, and uh, Discord server that uh, one of your colleagues set up is very useful as well. Have a great night.